Hi, and welcome to lesson 13 on the interference of quantum light. In the previous lessons, we talked uh, how to measure light and how to describe states of light, but we haven't really applied any transformations to the light. This is going to change in this lesson, where we are going to talk about beam splitters. So let's start with step one and uh, how to use quantum theory to describe beam splitters. So to remind you, a beam splitter is an optical device with two input ports, here denoted by 1 and 2, and two output ports, 3 and 4. And the light coming in from the input 1 has a chance to be reflected at the interface into mode 3 or transmitted into mode 4. And similarly, for uh, input mode 2, it has a chance to be reflected and enter mode 4 or transmitted and enter mode 3. So writing this mathematically, we have the following set of relations, where E3 is composed of R times E1 plus T plus times E2, where R and T are the reflection and transmission coefficients. Notice that for R E4, we write T times E1 minus R times E2. And this is due to energy conservation. This minus ensures that the intensity at output, that is mode 3 and 4, given by the modulus squared of E3 plus the modulus squared of E4, is equal to the intensity of the light at the input ports, E1 modulus squared plus E2 modulus squared. And we require this condition because we are considering only lossless beam splitters in this lesson. When you plug in the equations, you arrive at the following relationship that must hold between the uh, reflection and transmission coefficients. R squared plus T squared equals 1. Here, for simplicity, we are considering that R and T are real numbers. But that's going to change in the next few slides. And we will call this condition the unitary condition. Now, we can write this more formally as follows in the vector notation, where we've got the output vector of the fields E3 and E4 is related to the input vector of E1 and E2 by this transformation matrix, the beam splitter uh, matrix S, which is written in the following form. Again, don't forget this minus in, in over here. So how do we describe a quantum beam splitter? Well, again, the situation is the same. We've got two input ports, one and two, and two output por ports, three and four. And we want to know how, does, how do our field operators transform. So again, we can write them in vector form. Here we've got hat of E3 and hat of E4, corresponding to the output operators, is related to the input operators E1 and E2 by some transformation beam splitter matrix. Now, this matrix is actually the following. It's the exact same as the classical matrix. Sounds a little bit too good to be true, isn't it? So let's test that it really works. But how do we test that? How can we be sure that this is the correct expression and the correct transformation? Well, we know what are the commutation relations for, uh, uh, for this input mode 1, and what, what are the commutation relations for the input mode 2. A1 and A dagger must commute in such a way that they give 1, their commutator is 1. Same for mode 2. So in order for this transformation to be physical and to be correct, we require that the commutation relations at the output are preserved. In other words, the commutators of A3 with A3 dagger is 1, and same for mode 4. So let's check that indeed this is true for, for our matrix S. So we write out this uh, decomposition of our output modes in terms of the input modes. And here we are considering light of a single frequency, a single mode light, meaning that all these, uh, all the exponentials inside this E3 hat are going to cancel with the same exponentials that can be found coming from E1 and E2. Same for the factor of i and for the one photon amplitude. So all we're going to be left with are the creation and uh, annihilation operators. So here we've got A3 is equal to R times A1 plus T times A2, and similarly for A4. And we, like we said at the output, we must show that these A3 and A4 commute in the proper way. So we assume that at the input fields are physical fields and they satisfy the usual commutation relations. 
where A1, the commutator of A1 and A1 dagger is equal to 1, and same for mode 2, A2, commutator of A2 and A2 dagger is equal to 1, and the different modes commute. So all we have to do now is substitute for uh, our commutator of A3 with A3 dagger. We know what that is, we use this following relationship, and we get the following. So, we said that A1 commutes with A2 dagger. Similarly, A2 commutes with A1 dagger. So those cross terms are going to cancel, their commutators are going to be zero. What we are going to be left with is R squared times the commutator of A1 and A1 dagger plus T squared times the commutator of A2 and A2 dagger. And immediately you can see that these commutators are one by assumption and we get R squared plus T squared. But we said that for our matrix, R squared plus T squared is equal to one. In other words, A3 and A3, A3, and A3 dagger, when we compute their compu commutator, we get one, which is the correct commutation relations and our mat transformation matrix S is physical and correct. So that's good. Similarly, you can show it for A4 as well. Now, normally we will talk about 50-50 beam splitter. What that means is that the light has equal chance of being reflected or transmitted. So the corresponding matrix is given by this form. And we can check that R squared, which is half, plus T squared, which is also half, are equal to one. But in many textbooks and many research papers, you're going to find a different matrix for a beam splitter, the following matrix, S prime, where you have these complex factors of I. What they do is they introduce a phase shift between the two different output modes. So the question now is, which one is correct? Well, we can check the commutation relations for S prime, and we see that it also preserves the commutation relations. So both of them, seem to be physical matrices that we can use to describe our beam splitter. So which one is correct? And the answer is both are correct. And which matrix we need to use depends on the physical scenario. So in the labs, some beam splitters transform the light according to this, while others transform the light according to this matrix. In this lesson and in the following lessons, we're just going to use the first matrix. It's a little bit simpler, but be aware that this is also a possibility that's used in many textbooks and in actual laboratories. So now let's cover asymmetric beam splitters. So far we've only talked about symmetric beam splitters where the uh, reflection and transmission probabilities are equal for uh, input mode 1 and input mode 2. But that doesn't need to be true. In particular we can have different coefficients r and t for input mode one, and different coefficients R prime and T prime for input mode two. So in such a case, our beam splitter matrix is given by the following form. Here we see that the probability of A1 being trans uh, reflected at the beam splitter is given by R, the probability amplitude is given by R, while the probability amplitude of mode two being transmitted is T prime. And similarly for um, the output mode 4. So now we ask the question, when does such a matrix preserve our commutation relation? Well, again, we can write out uh, beam splitter, our transformed output modes, A3 and A4, we find the following relationship, and we demand that A commutator of A3 and A3 dagger is equal to 1, and similarly for output mode 4. What that leads us to is the following set of conditions. When the beam splitter matrix satisfies these relationships, then it's a proper beam splitter matrix. In particular, we have that modulus of R squared plus modulus of T squared is equal to one. The cross terms are all zero, and we demand that the modulus of R and R prime are the same, and the modulus of T and T prime are the same. These are the unitary conditions for the most general asymmetric beam splitter, where the entries are T and R prime T prime are complex numbers. And such a matrix preserves the commutation relations.